Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. I'm joined by Sheldon Richmond, the foundation's vice president. This is the Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you the libertarian perspectives on the burning issues of the day. Sheldon, back to Iraq. Uh, I mean, it, it just—it's uh, a never-ending saga here. It's—it's it's not as long as the never-ending obsession with Cuba, but uh, it sure ranks up there among the long-time ongoing crises that the U.S. national security state is getting all upset about. The latest one, of course, is dealing with this group ISIS that um, the Pentagon is saying that poses an immediate threat to the West. You've got interventionists all riled up. They're, they're pacing the floors. They can't sleep at night. All they're thinking about is now is ISIS is coming to get us. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating to me how the national security state can engender these these official enemies, a constant changing array of official enemies to get people all riled up, well, only Americans, all riled up and scared. Uh, you know, we, we can think back to the Cold War, the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, before that Adolf Hitler, and then, uh, you know, North Korea, North Vietnam, and then, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden and the terrorists and the Muslims and I mean it just never stops and here's the latest one uh, that is supposedly coming to get us which is going to justify a renewed intervention into Iraq seems to me that this is a classic confirmation of the entire failure of interventionism the fact that they have to go back into Iraq to start killing more people, what better proof of failure of the Persian Gulf War and the later uh, intervention in Iraq than the need to go back in and try to fix everything? What do you think? Well, they're, they're going back to fix a problem that, uh, that they created. I mean, what gives credibility to the whole thing, of course, is that there were attacks in the past from al-Qaeda. And, uh, and maybe, uh, you know, associated type of people, uh, 9-11 being the most uh, dramatic. So it, 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 there's a real thing there that they can whip up American concern about, namely those attacks. And no one would like to see those repeated again. The, the thing uh, that, uh, that we need to point out, of course, is that these are, these are threats that are byproducts of American policy. Not that they deliberately created the threats. That's not the point. The point is that it's a, it's a predictable byproduct of what U.S. policy has been. And we can see this very clearly with the rise of this Islamic State, uh, which is now holding a big uh, part of uh, Iraq and uh, Syria. Uh, there was no uh, al-Qaeda even. This is, of course, a spinoff of al-Qaeda. It's been condemned by al-Qaeda as too violent. So uh, let's put it in co the context. And where, and where uh, ISIS beheaded uh, an American journalist uh, last week, uh, Al Qaeda freed an American journalist from Syria just what yesterday. So, as if to say, look, we're not as bad as those guys are, and apparently they're not. So, there was no Al Qaeda, not much less no ISIS or, I, or IS now, uh, uh, Islamic State in Iraq before the U.S. invasion under George W. Bush in 2003. There was no Iraq. Say what you like about Saddam Hussein, and I, <laughs> I was, uh, I was the uh, lowest ranking fan of Saddam Hussein, which is to say no fan at all. There was no uh, such uh, organization as Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda became a presence in Iraq after the U.S. went in and disrupted that society, not knowing, you know, what the results were going to be. And so by they decapitated the, uh, you know, the government in, in Iraq which then let loose a flurry of activity that led to the rise of al-Qaeda and then uh, eventually to uh, this uh, Islamic State. And also, if you look at Syria, the U.S. in, what, 2011 declared, along with Britain, that, so that uh, Bashar al-Assad had to go. There was no way he could remain in power. He was no longer uh, legitimate. That then gave, uh, that was like a magnet to ISIS types, who, who came from Iraq into Syria and uh, was fighting on the U.S. side. Not that we were, not that the U.S. Uh, uh, was side by side with them self-consciously, but they had the same object objective, getting rid of Assad. That boosted and made legitimate uh, the, the uh, that group of people, including uh, also the Al-Qaeda affiliate, El-Nusra.
uh, those people then fl- flowed back into Iraq and are fighting the Shia uh, Saddam, namely Maliki, who's on his way out now, but he was behaving in an authoritarian, sectarian way. So this is totally the creation of U.S. policy. I'm not saying it's an intended consequence, but it is a consequence. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's what I mean when I say that this is definite confirmation of the entire philosophy of foreign interventionism. I mean, if you go back to, let's say, the U.S., I mean, the, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the U.S. sucks them into doing that, and uh, U.S. officials were ecstatic about that. They, they talked about giving the Soviet Union its Vietnam, and uh, then they, the U.S. starts supporting the, the rebel groups there. That inevitably gives rise to Osama bin Laden, al-Qaeda, uh, which then ends up, you know, uh, trying to oust the U.S. from Afghanistan. And then you've got the, the, the Persian Gulf intervention, the, the, the destruction of, of the water and sewage facilities in Iraq. You've got all those children dying throughout the 1990s, the Iraqi children, hundreds of thousands from, from illness, from the, from the uh, infected waters there because they didn't have the water and sewage treatment plants that had been destroyed by the Pentagon during the Persian Gulf War. You've got the, all that anger and hatred welling up. You've got troops stationed in, in Islamic holy lands, U.S. troops. You've got the unconditional support to the Israeli government. And, and then you, so you get, end up with 9-11 and Al-Qaeda and Osama, and uh, then somehow or another all this uh, morphs into more interventionism. You've got, as you point out, what's going on in Syria, where, where the U.S. is supporting the rebels. But from what I understand, the rebels also include now this, the, the people that are forming ISIS. And that, in fact, many of the people that the U.S. were supporting moved from the groups that the U.S. was supporting into ISIS. And so you, you've got this constant fermentation taking place as, as a direct result of foreign interventionism. I mean, if you compare it like the, to the Swiss people, you don't see them pacing the floor in anxiety of, oh, my gosh, ISIS is coming to get us and Al Qaeda is coming to get us. Saddam's coming to get us. All the things that the, that the American people have been besieged with because the, the Pentagon, the CIA have pummeled them with all these ongoing threats and perpetual crises. And it's all traceable to what the U.S. government has been doing overseas. It, it's like this living life of perpetual crisis, perpetual war, perpetual foreign enemies with the supposed quest of achieving peace and stability. This is no way to live. You know, when will Americans finally realize that all of this mess is directly attributable to the foreign policy that this, that this government has, uh, has maintained for several decades now? Yeah, the, the, the line that's gaining uh, a lot of currency, being repeated much, very often, mostly by Republicans, but among Democrats, most, uh, most prominently by Hillary Clinton, who uh, everyone seems to think will be running for president and is the likely nomination for the Democrats. Uh, the line is that if Obama had only intervened in Syria early on and helped uh, fund and arm the so-called moderate opposition to Assad, there never would have been ISIS. And this has been blown to smithereens by a, a great scholar at the University of San Francisco, Stephen Zunas, who points out that uh, you know, this, this, this argument uh, is completely without foundation for a few reasons. Number one, like I said, there was no al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, to move into uh, uh, um, Syria uh, when, uh, when there was pressure being put on Assad. So, that again, it originates with the U.S. intervention. But two other points he makes namely that the ra- these radical factions in Syria uh, obtained their guns and weapons by taking, taking them away from the so-called moderate uh, free Syrian army that the U.S. and allies have been um, uh, sending. So, they're, you know, so if you arm them, that's the source of a lot of the, ra- of the more radical, the more violent factions' uh, weapons. They take them away from the so-called moderates, and a lot of the so-called moderates have uh, gone over to El Nusra or uh, ISIS uh, uh, with their guns. So it can't make sense that if, if Obama had uh, funded and armed the moderates, uh, you know, more strongly, 
in 2011, there wouldn't have been this Islamic State. That can't make any sense if they were just taking the guns away from the so-called moderates. And this idea that there are moderates, which I'm glad to see that the that Obama uh, has uh, mocked. He's mocked this idea. I think he's called it a fantasy or something that that there uh, you, you can arm mo- moderates in Syria and win the day against Assad. Uh, you know, moderates tend not to be fighters, right? Middle class lawyers who don't like the Assad regime because it's authoritarian and violent, they're not the ones that are going to be taking guns and fighting. That's not their way. That's part of what it, I guess, means to be a moderate. The people that are going to do the fiercest fighting are the people Obama says he doesn't want to associate with. But we're now we're now on we've been on on the same side. I say we, meaning the U.S. government. On that we we it's been on the same side as the Al Qaeda affiliate and the Islamic State because their objective is to not only to kill each other, of course, but to get Assad. And Obama's objective is to have Assad out. Uh, I, I agree with what Patrick Coburn, a great reporter who's in that region and just has a book coming out on all this now, uh, points out that we, we, you know that the U.S. policy helped create it, and we are. You know, we got to make up our, you know, we, well, I don't think we should be on either side. We should stay out. But he's saying, hey, Obama, make up your mind. Either you're a de facto ally of Assad or you're a de facto ally of the Islamic State. You can't have it both ways. This is just totally crazy, even from their own point of view. Yeah, it really goes to show the whole moral bankruptcy of the pro-empire, pro-interventionist crowd. Is it not too long ago they were saying, we need to get rid of Assad. We need to do whatever is necessary to get rid of this brutal dictator. Ignoring, of course, that Assad had been the U.S. government's partner in the torture rendition program, because that's where the CIA, somehow or another negotiating the deal under the table, uh, sent, um, I think it was Mehar Arar over to Syria for purposes of torturing him. So it starts out with this torture partnership with Assad. It then shifts to, hey, American people, you've got to now start standing against Assad. He's an official enemy. And now you've got people within the, the U.S. government saying, well, maybe we should align ourselves with Assad. Maybe we need to switch sides again and become his partner. And when people say, well, how can you become a partner of this? You've been telling us this, this guy's a monster, that national security is at stake and so forth. The, the defenders of that proposal are saying, oh, well, look, we have to make partnerships with all kinds of monsters. We made partnerships with, with uh, Joseph Stalin and the Soviet communists in World War II. And, of course, uh, there's any other number of that, those types of, of partnerships with brutal regimes. I mean, it really goes to show you the, the utter cor- corruption that comes with this way of life and has come with this way of life. And the other thing I want to say, you know, is on the beheading of this guy, you know, they're, they're pointing out that the beheading of this, of this reporter, Foley, it shows how how brutal and, and, and horrific these people are. Well, granted, I mean, nobody's going to say that these – these people are saintly or anything like that. But notice why it's done. You see, nobody looks at the motives. And and they it was done out of anger and, well, actually rage for the U.S. bombing campaign that was initiated most recently against this force in Iraq. So it's another classic example of where the U.S. goes and kills people, and it has this blowback effect, this this adverse effect. And 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 l- let me tell you something, Sheldon. If if any of these groups make their way into the United States and do another 9/11, another terrorist attack, we're going to hear the same thing that they hate us for our freedom and values. They're coming to get us, and so forth. When actually the rage is occurring the same way it occurred before 9-11 when we had the sanctions against Iraq, they were killing those children, all the other things that were that the U.S. was doing along with the, the invasion of Iraq after 9-11, killing multitudes of people, multitudes of people in Afghanistan who had nothing to do with 9-11. It's going to be the same thing. They're going to say... The terrorists just hate us for our freedom and values. We need to take away more of your freedoms here at home. We need to spy on you more here at home. And, oh, by the way, it's just a coincidence, but we need ever-increasing budgets for the national security state apparatus, the Pentagon, the CIA, to keep us safe from all these threats that the policies themselves have engendered. Well, yeah, that's right. So we need to uh, discuss in detail what uh, those policies are that, uh, that uh, engender that kind of uh, uh, hostility against the United States, since I agree with you. It's not because 
we're not a Muslim country or because we have, uh, you know, uh, freedom of speech and, uh, you know, uh, not no censorship of movies. Uh, and that's not why people come over and fly planes into buildings. Uh, Robert Pape's uh, research at the University of Chicago makes, uh, uh, you know, shows pretty conclusively that, that suicide uh, missions are, are, are linked to uh, occupation and other kinds of uh, foreign, you know, uh, intervention in, in those countries, not just people one day getting up and saying, let's go kill some Americans because, you know, they're having too much fun or they have MTV. That's, that's not what happens. It, the policies that offend people over there, and l- l- let's be clear, uh, the people of ISIS are among the nastiest people on earth. I have no problem accepting that uh, claim. They're terrible people. They crucify people. They behead people. They are oppressing and, and killing uh, religious minorities over there, including Christians and the uh, Yazidis. And, uh, you know, it, it's a terrible, terrible thing. That's one reason why uh, U.S. policy is, has, has such, you know, that's why we can say U.S. policy has been so evil that it's brought about things like that. Uh, so there's no kind words here for the Islamic uh, State. Of course, they're not the only bad people in the world, but that's where the, the tension is right now, and they're terrible. The policies that make people mad at the U.S. are have been, you know, decades long now, support for the corrupt uh, Gulf monarchies, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, as an example, the uh, consistent uh, uh, backing of the uh, Egyptian military uh, government, which included just a couple of years ago of overthrowing a democratic, ele- democratically elected um, uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, president and government, which and, and the overthrow by the coup, which was you know basically backed by the U.S. Certainly, uh, aid was not uh, was not ended to it, and, and the U.S. fully supports now the new government of Al Sisi. Uh, uh, overthrowing a Muslim Brotherhood president just gave lots of ammunition to these Islamic uh, violent radicals who can say, look, in Egypt they did give. Uh, 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 democracy a chance, and look what look what happened. Before two years were up, the guy was, uh, or maybe I think about a year after his inauguration, the guy was overthrown by the military and with the U.S. Uh, applause. So it, it just was a demonstration that that for Al Qaeda and those types and worse to say, uh, see, our strategy is the right one, not politics, not peaceful politics. Uh, so, so there's that. There's the consistent uh, support for Israel's war on the Palestinians, and this, of course, is just is still going on now in Gaza, the latest episode. They see all that stuff, and they regard, therefore, the United States and the American people, and they don't distinguish the two, as we saw from 9-11, as the enemy, because it supports the things that they regard as evil in their, in their region. That's what's got to change. Yeah, and it's there's the, the bombing and the assassinations that factor into this too. You know, I mean, there, there's some brutality taking place on the part of the U.S. here. That when they they fire a missile at some guy that they say is a terrorist, there's certainly been no conviction that uh, of terrorists that they're just assassinating people without any kind of due process of law. Oftentimes, they kill the people around him, his children, his his wife. They don't care. They say, well, as long as he's in there and we've targeted him as a terrorist, well, we're, we regret that there's people with him, but tough luck. How can people not get angry over that kind of callous attitude toward toward human life? And and you see it uh, with the bombings, too, the, 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 the Air Force bombings. It, they'll bomb uh, uh, what they consider is a legitimate target, no matter how many people are around. They say, what difference does it make? As long as we get our man... Uh, that's all that matters, and and I, I, it's it's impossible to underestimate the effect that this has on people over there when they see this happening, and so you have this this attitude is we're going to get revenge, and then when they get the revenge, all of a sudden our side gets angry and full of rage, like on nine eleven, and says we're going after you. So you have this perpetual cycle. That keeps the uh, the national security state in high cotton, ever increasing budgets. You've got the people in American people in an ever present state of anxiety and and concern and fear with color codes and so forth. And so your your question's a good one. I mean, what is the cause of this? What are the solutions to it? And I often just point to to Switzerland. You know, they have the kind of foreign policy in which the United States was founded. 
the two foreign policies really mirror each other. The founding foreign policy of America and the, and the foreign policy of Switzerland. They don't have all these foreign military bases. They don't have foreign aid to dictatorships in, uh, such as the Egyptian uh, dictatorship that you point out. They don't meddle in all these countries. They're not out there involved in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They just mind their own business. And that's really the solution of this. And th this is what Americans finally have to come to the realization, that their own government, and it's, that it's pro-empire and pro-interventionist foreign policy, is at the root of, of this perpetual crisis environment in which we're living. And that all you have to do is just dismantle this military machine. You bring all the troops home from overseas, Germany, Korea, China, just bring them home. And, and then discharge them because they really don't, they're not needed. There's no threat of an invasion here. When, when uh, General Dempsey says, oh, ISIS and the Islamic State is a grave threat to the West, he's talking that it's a grave threat to the U.S. national security state's imperialist uh, holdings overseas. But this, this group doesn't have any hundreds of thousands of transport ships. It doesn't have millions of troops that would be necessary to cross the ocean to invade the United States. And so that's what we've got to keep uh, stressing, that the root of all of this constant crisis environment is this foreign policy of empire and interventionism. And that if, if we want to restore a society of peace, prosperity, harmony, stability, where the American people are, are freely interacting with the people of the world. you got to dismantle this military machine, the warfare state, and at the same time liberate the private sector to start interacting with the people of the world. It's really the only solution there is to this constant environment of official enemies, crisis, chaos, adversity, anxiety, and so forth. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that Dempsey and the other officials are trying to uh, scare Americans into thinking that there could be an invasion by the Islamic State. Uh, you know, it's some this, you know traditional sort of military invasion. What they're talking about is terrorism. Uh, there are apparently uh, people participating in the Islamic State with American passports, British passports. They think the killer of this uh, of uh, of um, Foley, the reporter Foley, was a Brit. He did speak with a British accent on the on the video. Uh, so it's yeah. So it's not so much an invasion by like an army, which of course would be ridiculous. That's not going to happen, but rather small scale operations, relatively small scale operations, relative to a major invasion by an armed force like 9/11, which is not some in, some insignificant thing. That was a, a terrible thing. That was a big thing. That wasn't that wasn't even like the the Boston Marathon, which you know killed quote only a few people. Terrible as it was, it wasn't like 9/11. Uh, knocking down two major buildings and crashing into the Pentagon. So the, that's the fear they're trying to foment, and that, that's not an irrational fear. If we keep do, that's our point. If we keep doing, if the U.S. government keeps doing what it's doing, it will be in a way inviting those uh, kinds of incidents. We don't want people coming over intending to blow up, even in suicide missions, uh, you know, anything, a shopping mall, any kind of public. Uh, facility and kill innocent Americans. That's why it's urgent that the U.S. turn around this foreign policy, this foreign policy of interventionism. Uh, so we don't need to play that down and say, well, that's not going to happen. I mean, I'm not going to assess the likelihood. But we don't need to play it down and say that, well, that, that, that could never happen. Number one, it's possible it could happen. But number two, that's exactly why it's urgent that the foreign policy be changed. So I don't mind saying, uh, yeah, it could happen. That's why we need a total reform of U.S. foreign policy and the embrace of non-interventionism. Yeah, no, I'm glad you clarified that. Because my, my, my point is this, is that when he says it's an immediate threat to the West, I, I get the sense that he's saying, oh, we need to go over there and fight this ISIS because it's a threat to our way of life here in the United States. Well, it's not. It, it, at most, as you point out, the threat is a terrorist attack here and there. And, of course, innocent people are killed. But as you and I are pointing out, there's a reason for that terrorist attack. It's driven by anger and rage over the fact that the U.S. is over there doing bad things to people. If the U.S. simply gets out of the Middle East and 
for that matter, the rest of the world, that is, the U.S. government gets out, then all of a sudden the anger and rage dissipates, no more uh, threat of a terrorist attack. Now, does that mean that all the problems are resolved in Iraq or Israel or Palestine or Egypt? Of course not. But it means that the U.S. national security state is not fueling the fires in those countries that then is causing the reverberation back here against, against the United States. I mean, I, I find it also interesting that, that President Obama has said that this is like a cancer that is spreading. You know, it's like this, like I, I analogize it to the flu, you know, like, like there's no real cause as to why they're coming after us. It just, it just happens to hit us like cancer or the flu. Well, as you and I are pointing out, that's just nonsense. That's as nonsensical as saying that they, they're coming over here because they hate us for our freedom and values. That was really happening is that they hate America, and as you point out, they're conflating America, the American people, with the U.S. government because of what the U.S. government has been doing over there. I mean, the most succinct way that this has ever been expressed was when Ron Paul said in that famous presidential debate, he says, they came over here to kill us because we, i.e. the U.S. government, was over there killing them. And uh, so, it, you know, at some point, somebody's got to stop this thing. And, and the way you stop it is you bring all these troops home. Sure, there still could be some retaliation for what U.S. forces have already done over there. But at least the rage, the level of rage starts to dissipate and Americans can start restoring a peaceful and free and harmonious, prosperous society here at home. No, I think that's right. Uh, you, you won't fully put the toothpaste back in the tube. There will still be, uh, yeah, some people, but I think it would be a relative few, will feel they have grievances, they want to settle with the U.S., and problems will remain there, as you rightly say. There still will be conflicts between Shiite and, uh, and Sunni, and between uh, secular Muslims and, and uh, non-secular Muslims, or, or the theocratic Muslims, uh, and, uh, and so there, there's plenty of uh, uh, you know, reason for uh, conflict over there, and it would be nice to see people settle it uh, peacefully. But the U.S. applying force to it is not going to be a way to uh, to settle to settle those things. It just makes the the violence worse. It pours arms in. Uh, you you rightly refer to the horrific uh, uh, murder of this reporter who was not a representative of the U.S. government. Let's remember he's a reporter. Uh, terrible uh, death of this man. Uh, a way to kill him. But you know how many? And, and, the, and you're right. Obama can stand up there and sanctimoniously uh, uh, condemn it as barbaric, just like John Hagel did. But uh, the question is, or, or sorry, Chuck Hagel. But the question is, um, how many, how many uh, kids, as well as adults, has have U.S. pilots beheaded, and and uh, through at thirty thousand feet, or by drone, where they're sitting in a uh, behind a console in, uh, let's say, Las Vegas. That's beheading too. If a bomb is blowing off people's heads, it doesn't matter that you didn't do it standing on the ground next to the person. So the U.S. policy is as barbaric. The people in the Middle East, uh, as as the beheading of this reporter, we should be honest and say about that. Say say that and if you know it's just done more remotely at thirty thousand feet or or thousands of miles away by remote control, but that's as barbaric as what these guys do. And so there's no uh, uh, Obama has no grounds for to stand up there self righteously and ca and condemn them until he ceases all that such activity there there himself. Right, and it, and it really goes to show you that that. All those people they killed in Iraq, uh, you know, we don't know the exact numbers because they wouldn't keep, the Pentagon refused to keep count of the Iraqi dead, although they were professing to do this for the Iraqi people after, of course, the WMDs didn't materialize. Uh, but the, the numbers range, you know, in the hundreds of thousands uh, of Iraqi dead and, and maimed, uh, injured, and for what? What did it accomplish? You, you got, I don't know, 5,000 men or so, uh, men and women, American soldiers killed in Iraq and uh, countless more uh, uh, maimed and injured and screwed up in the head. And What did it all accomplish? They, they told us we're going to have this model society and they praised the troops for, for bringing freedom and stability and prosperity to the Iraqi people. We still hear it today of the sacrifices American troops made. For what? I mean, it seems to me that this bombing campaign is, is just proof positive that all those people died for nothing. And uh, it's just another sad example 
of the failure of interventionism. And instead of acknowledging that, they're doubling down. And they're going down there and killing more people, which which is going to start the cycle all over again, the anger, the rage. We see it in the beheading of this reporter. We're going to see it possibly with terrorist attacks back here on American soil, possibly on Americans traveling in Europe. It's the same old syndrome, and it's all rooted in this interventionist foreign policy. In any event, that's the, the Libertarian Angle, our show for this week. I'm Jacob Hornberger, joined by Sheldon Richmond. Nice to be with you all again, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>